Welcome to the World War II Roundtable. Uh, Dr. Harold Deutsch and I uh, organized this roundtable in 1987. This is our 26th year of doing programs. Our speaker this evening is uh, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Michael D Doubler. I, I, I'm, I've said it two ways, so Doubler. Uh, Mike is from Tennessee, was born on the uh, Civil War battlefield of Mur Murfreesboro. He uh, was a West Point graduate, 23 years of, of uh, service. Uh, he was the historian for the National Guard Bureau, which uh, resulted in the two books that uh, Axel talked about. One is a hardcover that was published by the Guard Bureau, and the other is a current publication, Softback, from the University of, uh, of Kansas. Uh, after Mike does his uh, historical setup on the Guard as it came into World War II for mobilization, uh, General Vesey is going to talk about his experience with uh, mo being mobilized with the 34th Division. And General Elisario is then going to talk about the uh, recent mobilization of the Minnesota Guard as uh, they just returned from the Middle East. Um, one of the other great stories that needs to be highlighted as a part of the National Guard, and if you recall, we did that last year on Operation Plum, the tank battalion from Brainerd, the 194th Tank Battalion, uh, was uh, another great story that went into the Pacific and uh, is not to be lost in, in our memories of, uh, of this. But Mike, welcome to Minnesota. Thank you for um, doing some great things to get here. And we're looking forward to your telling the story of our guard. In Colonel Patton, thanks for that nice introduction. Um, it's great to be back in Minnesota. I've been here uh, previously on a number of trips. And in those trips, I learned about the people of Minnesota, uh, that they're very welcoming, they're very hearty, and uh, they always have a smile and are willing to, to help in any way that they can. I've also gained an appreciation for the beauty of your state. Uh, it's wetlands, it's wildlife, and so on. And on this trip, I gained an appreciation for the work you've done in your historical matters. I toured the uh, State Historical Society yesterday, and I've been to many state historical societies, and I tell you, it's among the top. It's first class. Uh, I'd always wanted to see Fort Snelling. I've seen part of it. We're going to have a tour tomorrow. Again, I'm very impressed with the effort uh, that's being made to preserve Minnesota's history up here. And on this trip, I want to publicly acknowledge Colonel Patton for everything he's done to get me up here to take care of me. And it's made uh, my trip a lot easier. And because, let me tell you this, for a person who's been publicly speaking for over 20 years, sometimes you never know what's going to happen when you go somewhere. I'm re I remember one time I was at, uh, I, I went to a graduation exercise at a small institution. And in the course of the conversation, someone asked me from that place, which will remain anonymous, would you care to make some comments? I said, well, sure, if you need me to do that, I can do that. So I go to the graduation ceremony, and the next thing I know, I'm being asked to come up and sit on the stage with a, a, some other distinguished guest. And the ceremony starts, and the speaker gets up and introduces the first speaker, and he comes up and makes a comment or two, and he introduces the next gentleman, he makes a comment or two, and then he goes on to some other business. And I'm thinking, well, okay, no big deal, you know, he... Uh, he uh, passed me over, no big deal. I'll just enjoy the day and everything. And while I'm having these thoughts, all of a sudden, he starts reading the biographical sketch of the uh, main speaker. And I'm sitting there saying, gee, uh, I ought to know this guy. Uh, holy cow, he's talking about me. <laughs> and I had prepared two or three minutes on leadership and the challenges of life, which immediately turned into a 15-minute presentation. Because I've learned there's one thing to be successful at a graduation commencement speech. Be short 
because the students want to get their, uh, their degrees and leave. I always remember, I hate to say this, but it's true, the dullest, the most boring speech I've ever heard was at my commencement exercise when I graduated from West Point. I don't remember a thing about it. Those students want to get out of there. So I got up on no notice and gave my speech. And so, sir, I want to thank you for letting me know weeks ahead of time that I would be the, uh, the keynote speaker tonight. Uh, I'm very impressed with your group. You can look around tonight, given our conditions, and these are the true believers. And I want to thank all of you for coming out on a, on a night of inclement weather. I hope, uh, I hope to make your time worthwhile. I always like to know a little more about the groups I'm going to speak with, so I'm going to take a quick survey. How many of you have served in the National Guard? Okay. How many of you have served on active duty in any service? Okay. And we saw our, our war veterans earlier. Um, that helps me a lot in terms of, of the knowledge. I'm going to talk tonight about the nexus of the two things I've written about the most, which is the Second World War and the National Guard's participation in that war. And before I do that, I have to make a public recognition. Uh, over 10 years ago, when I finished writing the manuscript for I Am the Guard, which became Civilian and Peace, Soldier at War, uh, I was looking for someone to, to write a credible forward to the book that would add a lot to the book, because this was a book I was hoping that would last a long time and become the story of the National Guard. And my boss at the time, General Roger Schultz, said, I got, we got just the person to be General Vesey. And we contacted General Vesey, and he gladly read the manuscript and wrote the foreword to the book, and it, it's, it was fantastic. And General, I, I regret I did not meet you till last night, but I want to say publicly thank you for writing the foreword to that book. There's no other person I can think of. That book, I think, is going to live on. And there's no other person who served in the Guard and has done as much as you have that will have their name associated with that book. And I think that's so appropriate. And again, I want to publicly thank you for doing that. <clears throat> General Nash, sir, thank you for being here. Thank you for your time yesterday and at the dinner. I'm always heartened when I see a leader involved with a history program. That's what it takes to increase the historical mindedness of the command, and I know that you have that, and I appreciate that. Uh, also, uh, General Elisario, I'm very anxiously looking forward to your presentation. I have a great interest in the guard and the war in Iraq, and I'm really looking forward to that. I want to cover three questions about American military history before I get to the main topic tonight. And these are th three enduring questions about our military policy in the United States. One of the things I'm most proud of with the National Guard book as its author is that it contains an overview of the military policy of the United States. And I learned a lot writing that book, and I think you'll learn a lot reading that book from that regard. I want to talk briefly about the three great questions of American military policy, because guess what? They're still with us today, and our formation for our thinking about military affairs and even the analysis. The first one is, who serves in the military? That's been the question from the beginning, even the early militia, on through into the revolution and so on. We have decided as a country that, that the people who will man the military is a mix of professionals and citizen soldiers. That's the decision we made. The answer from the very beginning and embedded into our Constitution. But that begs another question. If we're going to have a mix, what is that mix going to be? How many regulars are we going to have? How many citizen soldiers are we going to have? And what's that balance? That's a very eternal question. Given that we have these two groups, what are the expectations for each, each of them? What is the mix? And any time as a nation we go through and debate military topics, which we are today, 
especially as it uh, pertains to our funding. That question is at the forefront of the debate. The second great topic is, being that we figure out how to man the force, how is it trained, equipped, and paid for? It is the duty, the mission of the U.S. Congress, outlined in the Constitution, to raise the United States Army. And sometimes the Army forgets that. I saw that firsthand in my years in the Pentagon, and in general, I, I probably you saw the same thing sometimes. It is the Congress's mission. They listen to people. If you have issues affecting your National Guard, some people can't tell you this, but I can. Contact your representative and let them know how you feel about the National Guard. It's an invaluable resource. When you talk about budgets, that's a political decision. We're in the middle of it right now. It's all over the newspapers. Sequestration. This is not happening. The Blue Angels have been grounded, and so on. Those are political decisions. But once those budgets are decided, there's a question of how do we equip the force with that money? And that's always been, a, uh, in, in most eras, a time of contention between the active and the guard. Now, the last one is probably the most interesting of these three. So we have who serves, how will they be trained, equipped, and paid for? What is their mission? This is a big one especially for our citizen soldiers. Are they going to be a domestic constabulary? Will they be a homeland defense force? Will they be an overseas garrison? Will they be expected to do expeditionary operations alongside the regulars? Are citizen soldiers to go into action on day one? It's always a big question. And I want to remind everyone, as informed citizens, that the National Guard has done a lot in terms of defending the homeland and, and homeland security related missions since 9-11. Uh, but the Guard's always done that. And I'm going to talk about what it did at the outbreak of World War II in a minute to illustrate that point. But the Guard's always been responsible for our homeland and it is a growing mission. We're all noticing this pattern of increased extreme weather conditions. <laughs> The Guard's involved with that, and it's going to be more involved, I'm going to tell you why. We have more people in the United States. Do you know the population of our country has doubled since 1960? And let's be honest about it. There are people living in a lot of places that really shouldn't be living there. I noticed a clip from Hurricane Sandy on one of these outer islands off Long Island that basically houses up on stilts. You know, with about 10 feet of sand on either side of them? Okay. It's a risk you take. Well, the chances are the risks get greater. It, regardless of what happens, your National Guard will be there. Okay. I want to talk a little tonight about what the National Guard was like before World War II. Because it was a very different guard. And like the rest of our nation, World War II was a changing event for our society and our National Guard. And I know General Vesey will talk a little about that tonight, but I want to just hit some highlights. All of you are students of World War II. I want to tell you something that I've learned through the years. A working knowledge of World War I will greatly enhance your understanding of World War II because it applies in so many different ways. World War I cast an indelible mark both on the U.S. Army and on the National Guard. The student of World War II needs to have this knowledge to fully understand and appreciate the developments in World War II. Simply put, the major military developments of the Second World War were an answer to problems identified in 1914 through 1918. But many of the real outcomes in World War II were disturbing surprises. Let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. World War I ends, there's eight million people killed. And everyone says, no more war. This is the war to end all wars. This can't happen again. The military experts were looking at the experience of war, attrition, 
trench warfare and saying, never again. What is going to be the antidote to trench warfare? It's going to be the tank and mechanized forces. In the air, the air advocates were saying it was going to be the bomber. We're going to kill all the other civilians, and that will break their back, and we won't have these long wars. That was the plan. This is the story of the interwar period. Here's what happened. In other words, they were saying we cannot afford to have an expensive, indecisive war anymore with 8 million people killed. Here's what happened, though, in World War II. The tank and the mechanized forces were more decisive. They produced decisive results. The Russian juggernaut made it to Berlin. The British and Americans got over the Rhine and into Germany and up into northern Italy. Mission accomplished. Wait a second. Here was the surprise. Armored mechanized warfare was not less costly than World War I. You look at the casualty figures of Normandy and of the Battle of the Bulge and the battles on the east, in the east, and they rival any of the great bloodbaths of World War I. 52 million people were killed. And the same was true in the air war. The air advocates thought that the airplane was going to uh, prevent trench warfare. And what happened, a great irony is, attrition warfare occurred in the skies. It's just a great irony of it. So things don't always turn out the way we do, we think. Now, coming out of World War I, the organization of both the active army and the National Guard was established that still is with us today. The numbering system. Pershing and this general staff came up with a numbering division for armies, corps, divisions, brigades, regiments, and so on. That is still with us today. The wear of the shoulder patch, so on is another example. It was Black Jack Pershing that established the standard, the new standard in the 20th century for the American soldier the wear of the uniform, that every soldier was disciplined. And the thing that Black Jack emphasized was that each soldier was totally proficient with either his personal weapon or his crew serve weapon. The American doughboy was a shooter. And that came out of that period and also affected the National Guard. But unlike today, the focus of training in the National Guard in the interwar period, the intent of it was to produce a single soldier who was qualified on his personal or crew serve weapon. Drill was held twice per month on weeknights with 15 days of annual training, usually during the summer months. If any collective training was conducted, it occurred during this annual training period and focused on the most rudimentary tactics of movement, and the attack and defense of static positions. However, unit movements, convoy movements, and so on were conducted routinely, and this helped immensely during the initial unit training and maneuvers which occurred following Pearl Harbor. One of the greatest differences going into World War II was that the Guard now existed as a permanent organization of the several states in the U.S. Army. To put it simply, guard units could train, mobilize, fight, and return home as units. This had not happened in the First World War. Literally in France, guardsmen were given orders saying, hey, your enlistment's expired in the Minnesota Guard. Uh, we're done with you, and you're a Joe civilian, and here's your ticket home. Have a good trip home. The guard was very upset with that, and they fixed it in the interwar period so that they would mobilize as groups and come home as groups. There's also another thing that I like to emphasize when I talk about the Guards organization, and I mention this to public groups, political leaders, and so on whenever I'm with them. And it's an important point I want to make about the Guard, actually two of them. That's not well understood. There's an expectation in the Guard that a commander has the right the right to command his troops on active duty, providing he meets the qualifications. They have that right. Conversely, the troops feel that they have the right to serve under the leadership 
that recruited and trained them in their local community in peacetime. And many people don't understand this. And this was one of the difficulties in the mobilization during World War II, the reassignment of commanders. Those that did not meet standards, and there were many, were relieved and sent home. But there was too much of a propensity to move people around too quickly, in my view. This legacy is still with us today, and we've seen it in the last couple of years as our troop units from the National Guard deploy to, to Afghanistan, Iraq, and come back. I'll never forget in the summer of 2006, I happened to be in the brand new concourse building that opened at DFW Airport in Dallas, waiting for a connecting flight, and there was a huge gathering of people down at the concourse, and this was a Texas National Guard unit getting ready to go to Iraq. They were, that was, they were leaving. And I went down there and took a look at that, and I tell you, there a lot, of sheer, a lot of tears were being shed that day. But that was the legacy that came out of World War II and out of that period that they went as a group. And it was great to see that on display. Now, what did the Guard do at the beginning of World War II? In September of 1939, the U.S. Army, with only 190,000 regulars, was ranked, according to General Marshall, the 17th largest in the world, just behind the Romanian army. With the tide of war rising in Europe, President Roosevelt sought to enhance military readiness by increasing the Guard's annual paid drills all the way up to 60 from 48 and expanding annual training from two to three weeks. Hitler's stunning defeat of France in May 1940 prompted a sharp response from America. Congress declared a national emergency, passed the nation's first peacetime draft, and authorized the president to call out the National Guard for one year. Now, there's a couple of things about World War II that I've learned. I think most people, some of you probably do, but most people don't fully recognize. There is a belief that, World, that Pearl Harbor happened, and all these people rushed to the recruiting stations and signed up and that this was the great turn of the tide. Well, that's true. That did happen. But the story that's not as well known is that there were a lot of American young men in 1939 and 40 and 41 who understood that war was coming and that they had been mired in the Great Depression for over a decade, and they went down and signed up. And one of them was my father, who enlisted in October of 1940. And I'm sure you know people who did that as well. Yes, a lot of people signed up after Pearl Harbor, but there were a lot of patriots who signed up before that. One of the reasons my father signed up is that Uncle Leo, his uncle, had been one of Pershing's doughboys. Uncle Leo is listening to the radio in Atkinson, Illinois, outside the Quad Cities. And he, one day he looked at my father, who was probably 16 at the time, and listen to what he said. He said, Alvin, we went over there and we pushed them back, but we didn't whip them. You boys are going to have to go over there and finish the job. Now, if a farmer in Illinois in 1938 has figured this out, a lot of other people had too. Another thing, a surprising statistic about the beginning of World War II is on the morning of Pearl Harbor, National unemployment stood at 11.14%. A lot of those young men were looking for jobs. They had seen other people serve in alphabet soup organizations, the CCC, the WPA. It was natural for them to join. Now, my father went down to Moline. He didn't get along with his brother too well at the time to sign up, and he wanted to go into the Army Air Forces or the Army Air Corps at the time and he couldn't pass the eye test. And he went home, and his brother looked at him and said, I told you you were no good. Even the Army wouldn't take you. My dad probably said a few choice words. He drove back to Moline the next morning and enlisted in the Army ground forces. He was released in October of 1945 and served uh, 39 months overseas during the war. There were people doing this. I just wanted to highlight that because you don't hear that enough. 
In September 1940, the National Guard was mobilized. Over the next year, 300,000 guardsmen entered active duty, doubling the size of the Army. The size and speed of the mobilization created several problems. Guard units often arrived at training camps that lacked adequate facilities, and all types of weapons and equipment were woefully short. Guardsmen used stovepipes to simulate cannons and mortars, carried sticks and brooms for rifles, and pretended that pine logs were machine guns. Now, having said all this, I think there's a big notion that you hear quite often is we were totally unprepared for World War II. Well, I'm not sure I agree with that. Uh, we were already producing a lot of weapons, but the political decision was made that they went to our allies to keep them in the fight. Do you know that we, spent, we sent thousands of trucks to Russia, and Stalin made the order that no photographs would be made of these deuce and a halves, and none have survived. But I think a lot of Russians would tell you that they, they rolled to Berlin in, a, in deuce and a halves, a lot of them. I think our unpreparedness in World War II has been overemphasized. We were completely unprepared for World War I. And it's Pershing and his men that sorted all that out. By, within 18 months, we had sent 2.1 million Americans to France in World War I. 2.1 million. That's incredible. A highlight of the pre-war mobilization was the Army's great force-on-force -force maneuvers in the fall of 1941. The Guard divisions fully participated in maneuvers in Louisiana, Tennessee, California, and the Carolinas, the largest field exercises ever conducted by American troops. The maneuvers provided valuable training for staffs and commanders, revealed unfit leaders, and identified rising stars ready for more senior command. There is a new book coming out that I just read a couple of months ago and wrote a promotional blurb for it, and I want to mention it tonight. Be on the lookout for it, because it's really good. It's a book called Battalion Commanders at War by Stephen Barry. And in this book, Mr. Barry analyzes the performance excuse me, of American battalion commanders in North Africa, Sicily, and Italy. And he's done some amazing research because he came up with some hard data that applies to the regulars, the guardsmen, and the reservists who fought in those theaters. And one of the things he came up with from based on interviews that, that these men left behind is that the, and you don't hear this ever, the general headquarters maneuvers did more to prepare the battalion commanders for combat than any other thing. Almost all of them have said that. Why is that? They learned about movement. Uh, Tactical movement, administrative movement. They learned, you got to think of the times, they learned that vehicles break down. Better count on it. Make provisions. Oh, by the way, you got to get refueled. Oh boy, we didn't have to do that, you know, with our straight infantry units. Uh, whenever you send a quartering party out, make sure you got your guy, the best guy you have with a map and a radio. Because if he gets lost, you're in a real bind. These are practical lessons that they learned. And here's one that's in the book that's very interesting. The, the battalion commander said in peacetime, our priority of supply, this is peacetime, was chow, water, fuel, and ammunition. That was the priority. You ever been around hungry troops that hadn't been fed? Chow's your number one priority. In combat, that priority was exactly reversed. Ammunition, fuel, water, chow. And they learned that during the GHQ maneuvers. You'll also learn from reading this new book that's coming out soon is that these were very courageous men. 50% of them were killed, wounded, or captured. One of them was Patton's son-in-law that wound up in Hamelberg uh, camp. It's a very interesting book, and I commend it to you. In late summer of 1941, Congress renewed the call-up of the Guard for six months. In other words, they called up for 12, and they served for 18. I think that's happened to Guardsmen recently in the past couple of years. Guardsmen were to remain on active duty until April 1942. Trust me, when this came out, these, these, a lot of these Guardsmen complained to Congress about this. 
And the politician's answer in November of 1941, boys, don't worry about it. You're going to be home in April. Don't worry about it. Well, Pearl Harbor changed all that. And it guaranteed that these men would serve for the duration of the war. On December 7, 1941, the Army had 34 divisions, all total. 16 in the regular Army and 18 in the Guard. And as most of you know, this number would eventually grow to 89, a growth of 55 divisions. If any of you are interested in writing a book, I believe that the raising and training of those divisions is an area that needs a lot more work. There's been some official histories done on it, but we need a good one volume uh, work that tells that story, including from the state level. That has not been done. The National Guard's first operational mission in World War II was to help defend the homeland. Guardsmen already manned much of the nation's coastal defenses and continued to do so until halfway through the war, when the Coast Artillery Branch was disbanded and mostly converted to air defense and field artillery. Guard flying units flew air patrols off the nation's coast looking for enemy submarines and other threats. One of my favorite stories from World War II is of an 8th Air Force colonel who was sent to Germany at, right at the end of the war to help repatriate their flyers. And he's standing there overwatching this process of, uh, of signing up, you know, accounting for our POWs. And he looks at a lieutenant standing in line. And he says, God, that guy's familiar. He's thinking to himself. And he, he's a colonel in the 8th Air Force. And he walks up to this guy and said, Lieutenant, I know you, but I, I can't remember where we've met before. And he said, I remember you. You were the assistant class leader in our uh, training school in Pensacola. Wow, you're right. How did you know that? I was in your class. How did you get here? Well, we took off one day on a B-25, and we saw a sub about 20 miles off the coast of Pensacola. And we're just out on a train mission, so we decided to buzz it, you know, say, what, to wave at our sailors. It was a U-boat. <laughs> this U-boat crew got out and got on their gun and with a lucky shot bought this B-25 down. And they went over and picked this crew up and these guys went to Germany for the rest of the war. It's an incredible story. <laughs> it's an incredible story. Have you heard the story about the Korean that was captured in Normandy? Uh, I'll tell that one later. <laughs> Crazy things happen, as they always do in war. So the Guard is flying these air defense missions off the coast. The defense of critical infrastructure became a key mission during the first year of the war. Guardsmen patrolled train stations after Pearl Harbor and calmed the frayed nerves of the citizenry. I'll never forget one morning in October of 2001, flying out of Baltimore, Washington Airport, within a month of the attacks of 9-11, and I I'll never forget this, I walked in the airport concourse that morning, and there's a three-man detachment of the Maryland National Guard walking through the airport with their weapons. And, pe and also they were standing with the security people. And I noted that so many Americans, people from Maryland, Baltimore as they say there, were thanking these guardsmen. You see, terror's in the mind. And if we can reduce the threat in the mind, you're going to win the war on terror among the citizenry. Guard detachments protected bridges, electric power stations, and industry manufacturing sites. However, trained military personnel were needed on the front lines, not defending the homeland. Listen very carefully to what happened. General George C. Marshall, our master strategist, made the key decision that the best means of securing civilian sites were to hire paid guards and night watchmen, not soldiers, thus freeing guard members for, to conduct training and to head for overseas. Today we call these contractors in the TSA. Right, wrong, or indifferent. Now I'll briefly go over the two theaters and what, what the guard did in the theaters. National Guard members were in the fight from the beginning in the Pacific 
and were among the first defenders of Hawaii on the morning of Pearl Harbor. In November of 1940, a year before Pearl Harbor, a Coast Artillery Battalion from California had deployed for training to Hawaii and had stayed there. They were the first guard unit to deploy for overseas duty in World War II. A month earlier, two National Guard regiments in Hawaii had been called active duty and were integrated into the island's chain defenses alongside the regulars. This was the famous 298th and 299th Infantry that eventually formed the, uh, the nucleus of the Nisei Regiment. When the Japanese attack struck, all three of these regiments took part in the defense of Oahu, firing the National Guard's first shot of World War II. While Congress was busy declaring war on December 8th, Guard units on the other side of the globe were already in combat against the Japanese. In November 1941, three guard units, New Mexico's 200 Coast Artillery and the composite 192nd and 194 tank battalions, partly from here in Minnesota, arrived to strengthen the defenses of the Philippines. The 200th Coast Artillery from New Mexico defended Clark Field on December 8th and shot down five Japanese planes. As the Japanese Army overran the Philippines, guardsmen fought valiantly for months on Bataan and Corregidor until all troops were forced to surrender. We need a good book on the defense and fall of the Philippines, in my opinion. That covers this. This is America's forgotten battle of World War II, in many regards, in my opinion. And it's not a pretty story, but the heroism of these men who felt abandoned. That's what they felt. We got screwed. We were left here, we are in an impossible situation, and General MacArthur was the only one that got out of here. That was their attitude. They hung together, they soldiered on, and most of, many of them were from the National Guard. Now, though the United States adopted a policy of Germany first in fighting the war, the immediate crisis in 1942 was in the Pacific, where Americans were already fighting the Japanese. For the first year of the war in the Pacific, the Guard provided much of America's offensive capability. The 164th Infantry entered combat in Guadalcanal in October of 42, joined soon after by two other Guard regiments. And all three were organized into the AmeriCal Division, the National Guard's 19th Division that fought in the war. The 32nd and 41st Divisions sailed immediately for the Pacific and became the first Army divisions to engage and fight the Japanese during the grueling campaigns in New Guinea. I want to make a, just a brief uh, comment about what happened at, in the mobilization that's tied to all this. As, as most of you know, Black Jack Pershing's Army was organized into a square division. Each division had four combat brigades. And when they, we had this propensity in the U.S. Army to reorganize when the war starts, and we did it in World War II, and rightly so, to the triangular division of three regiments. This meant that one regiment from each of these guard divisions was stripped away for other use. Three of them wound up on Guadalcanal. These other brigades, uh, it's just kind of a general statement, were used in what we would call today a theater defense role. Uh, one of them went to Puerto Rico, one of them went to the Canal Zone, one went to Fort Benning for school support, one went to Iceland, and so on. But they were immediately available for use, which is always important. The 10 guard divisions that fought in the Pacific were integral to the massive campaigns conducted to liberate the Philippines and to threaten Japan. In the Central Pacific, the 27th Division from New York fought on Macon Island, Anahuitak, Saipan, and Okinawa. Nine guard divisions played a key role in MacArthur's offensives that traversed New Guinea and the Solomon Islands and liberated the Philippines. When the final blow came in Manila, four guard divisions, the 32nd, 37th, 40th, and 43rd were at the vanguard of that attack. The guard divisions in the Pacific bore a significant portion of the burden of Army operations while suffering almost 50,000 casualties. I want to mention one thing about the incident on Macon Island when the 27th Division commander was relieved. There had always been an animos a friendly animosity 
between the Army and the Marines, especially after World War I. With this incident, when a Marine General Corps commander relieved the Army Division Commander in the 27th Division on Macon Island, and this is what the official Marine Corps history says, that this incident is the incident that institutionalized the rivalry between the grunts and the jarheads that we know today. That that was the spark that, that triggered all that. A quick comment about people. At the beginning of the war, the National Guard divisions had their own distinct and regional flavor. However, over time, the need to strip divisions of experienced soldiers to serve as a foundation for newly formed draftee divisions, high casualty rates, and normal personnel rotations gave the Guard divisions less of a distinct character. And by the end of the war, the influx of draftees and replacements had homogenized the entire army to a great degree into a truly national citizen soldier force with little regard for the pre-war designations as regulars or guardsmen. And one thing that we need to understand about modern warfare, I mentioned it earlier, is the tremendous demands on manpower that it makes. From casualties, people are reassigned, uh, divisions stay in a fight, or brigades, and it just takes a lot of manpower to sustain that effort. Now in Europe, the Guard Division saw immediate oversized, overseas duty. The 34th Division was the first Army Division to deploy to Europe after Pearl Harbor. In November 42, that division participated in the Allied amphibious assault in North Africa. By June of 43, two other Guard Divisions, the 26th from Texas and the 45th from Oklahoma, were in Tunisia. These divisions saw extensive service in North Africa, Sicily, and Italy, but only the 34th Division fought exclusively in the Mediterranean. The 45th Division accrued one of the most impressive combat records in World War II, along with the 34th Division, and the 45th Division had the distinction of, of participating in three amphibious assaults. Amazing statistic from World War II is that the 18 or 19 National Guard divisions, those 19 divisions conducted more amphibious landings than all of the other Army and Marine divisions put together. That's an amazing statistic. In addition to the divisions I mentioned, five other Guard divisions saw action in Europe between D-Day and the end of the war. Perhaps the best known combat action in Europe done by Guardsmen was the 29th Infantry Division participation in the D-Day assault on Omaha Beach, where the 116th Regiment was attached to the Big Red One for that. I, I keep trying to tell the Big Red One guy that this was the case, uh, and they're still not convinced. They like to tell you that that regiment was, was, was a sign of the Big Red One. It was not. It, by the second day, or the end of the first, end of the second day, General Gerhardt was on the beach, and the flag was up, and the war was on. Guard divisions played an important role in every major campaign. The 30th Division blunted the strong German counterattack at Mortain, and was one of the first American divisions to breach the Siegfried Line. The 35th Division assisted in the capture of St. Lowe and Nancy and ended the war on the Elbe River. As we know, the 28th Division suffered ghastly losses in the Hurtgen Forest, but redeemed its reputation during a series of stubborn defensive battles in the opening day of the Bulge, the 28th being from Pennsylvania. The 26th Division from the Northeast led the advance on the fortress city of Metz and participated in the relief of Bastogne and ended the war in Czechoslovakia. The 44th Division breached the Sea Fleet Line, captured Mannheim, and was in Austria at the end of the war. Altogether, the nine guard divisions that fought in the ETO suffered 125,630 casualties. Now I'm asked, did the National Guardsmen adapt in combat, as I outline in my book, Closing with the Enemy? Did the Guard participate in that? And let me just highlight 
that one of the greatest combat innovations of the war that occurred in Normandy was done by a National Guardsman. This was the rhinoceros tanks, the hedgerow cutters. This idea, it, it, it had come up in many divisions and commands, but the one that was adopted came from Sergeant Curtis G. Cullen of the New Jersey National Guard. I think he was in the 103rd Cavalry when he was mobilized. And that turned the tide, helped turn the tide in Normandy. Guard artillerymen excelled throughout the war. And there were many changes in that. And one of the things I want to tell you, I got to tell a World War II war story, right? Before I, before I end up tonight. And it's a story you haven't heard. Our artillery in World War II was unbelievable. Uh, the Germans repeatedly said that the concentration and accuracy and speed of the American artillery far surpassed that of the Russians. The Russians could throw a huge barrage out there, more like World War I, see? But the Americans could put time on target quickly and accurately. By halfway through the war in Europe, those who are artillery know the method of adjusting fire. We didn't do it. They had confidence in their ability. As long as they had a proper, the proper map for the height and the elevation and knew they had a grid coordinate, they would fire first time. And I want to tell you a story about that. There was a forward observer after the Battle of the Bulge. I believe he was with the 9th Division. It was so confusing, he wasn't even sure what division he was with because he had been moved from another unit in the carnage of the bulge. It was up in the area around Schmidt where one of the, the, this division was conducting a river crossing and a counterattack of the bulge. And the regiment that he was with was in the support role and the, the, the regiment on the right was conducting the river crossing. However, throughout the day, where this regiment was in this, up on this ridge in this tree line, if those who have been to Europe know what I'm talking about. You have ridge lines and they go down to the rivers and there's a plain usually and it goes up into another ridge line. The, the regiment, the American regiment that the Ford Observer was with was up on this ridge line and they were taking extremely accurate harassing and interdiction fire all day long. One guy would show, his, show himself, boom. One vehicle would show himself, boom. And the Observer figured out that somebody has this under direct observation. And more than likely, they are targeting this whole area. And when we attack tonight, they don't even have to see us. They'll just throw out their fire like, like an artilleryman should. Where are we being observed from? Ooh, didn't see anything, didn't see anything. The attack opens, you know, a mile away. And a very vigorous battle ensues. An artillery battle starts. And all of a sudden, this observer's looking at this contested, this area where he thought there had to be a German observer. Not in a church steeple, not in a village. There were orchards there. He brings his glasses down. All of a sudden, he sees a flash of light up in the top of a tree across the way. And he looks. I, I've left out something. About that time, an American artillery Piper Cub appeared overhead to begin coordinating fire. The Germans hated Piper Cubs. <laughs> Because when they saw them, they knew all hell was getting ready to break loose. This German observer had just, on a whim, taken his binoculars and looked up at this Piper Cub. And when he did, a flash of sunlight came off the prism of his lens and the observer saw it, you know, two clicks away. He said, I got you. I got you. And he looked. And there was an observer up in a tree, heavy camouflage, a tree, a radio man, and two security guys. Time for action. He calls the division artillery. They're heavily engaged in this river crossing operation. Get up, clear the net. Get off the net. He calls again. I need help. We got to take care of this before we're hit again. Get off the net. Get off the net. All of a sudden, a voice comes onto the company radio. King 21, checkmate 21, send your fire mission. He looks at his operating instructions. Uh, stand by. There's no call sign in my CEO like that. But, well, let me look a little further here. Oh. 
Checkmate 21, Corps Artillery, 155 Long Tom. Beautiful. Checkmate 21, King 21, Fire Mission. And he's thinking, I got one chance at this probably. Target enemy troops in the open with armor. <laughs> Roger, King 21, stand by. Shot over. They're sitting there in this relative quiet of this river valley, and all of a sudden, there's a freight train approaching in the sky, rumbling and tumbling and growling. And the observers figured out that Checkmate 21 has just fired a 12 round TOT of 155 Long Tom. And a few seconds later, come shot over. A few seconds later, the entire side of this ridge line erupts into a volcano of fire and smoke as these four Germans are blown to oblivion by a 12 round time on time barrage. Of, of TOT from 155 Long Tom. That's the American way of war sometimes. That observer was my father who told that story. He said, you, just, you can't believe what that artillery can do. And he always would tell that story saying, you know, just even from that distance, you could feel a concussion off those waves. So the American army adapted and trained and the guardsmen were part of it. The guard divisions which fought in World War II were integral to our victory. Of the 89 combat divisions that mobilized for the war, 19 came from the Guard. The Guard divisions were a ready standing force that deployed immediately, and without them, America's initial ground response might have taken years instead of months. And that's still true today. Our National Guard is a force in being that if properly trained, manned, and equipped, and given a mission, can do that mission when they're called upon to do so. In both Pacific and Europe, the Guard divisions were among the first units to see combat and bore their share of the fighting, often leading the way or battling alongside regulars and reserve divisions. They contained experienced officers and enlisted men that were often reassigned to help organize other units. The division's leaders proved that properly trained citizen soldiers were capable of fighting and coordinating combined armed forces during the toughest fighting imaginable. What was the legacy of World War II for the National Guard? Advances in military technology and tactics changed the face of the post-war National Guard. With the advent of the Air Guard, 1947, and the mechanization and motorization of the Army Guard, for which the Army Guard was completely unprepared. And rightly so. Let's think about it. In 1940, these units had left. Most of them were straight infantry. They came back a fully mechanized force with tanks and half tracks and self propelled artillery and nowhere to put them. So there was a great scramble, by as always, at the local level for guard commanders to, to protect and maintain this equipment till they could find a permanent home. Uh, I'll never forget, I read a story about a company commander in Kansas who now had four trucks in an infantry company and nowhere to put them. So it was General Fran Greenleaf, uh, sir, you may remember General Greenleaf. General Greenleaf took these vehicles home when he was a major and parked them in his, uh, his driveway of his house where they were secure, and they promptly broke the concrete apron on his house, which he promptly applied to the National Guard in the state of Kansas for uh, money to repair, and was promptly turned down. This is, for those of you who served in the Guard, this was the beginning of our system of mate sites. That's when that started. We had all this heavy equipment. We realized we had to co-locate it together to properly maintain it. That started right after World War II. More than anything else, the performance of guardsmen in World War II guaranteed that citizen soldiers would become part of the permanent military establishment that fought, 
and won the Cold War and indeed endures until the present time. What a tremendous legacy to be passed on to us from these brave men that mobilized and fought in World War II. You've been a great audience. I look forward to your questions. I always enjoy the question and answer period, and I understand now we're going to hear from one of those great men. General Vesey is one of the uh, great sources of pride of us Minnesotans. There is no one that went from the rank of Buck Private to Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. General Vesey was part of the artillery in the Guard. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to apologize for my appearance. Uh, I now lean into the wind when there is no wind. Uh, and I uh, hobble around with a stick. As some of you know, about a year and a half ago, uh, the left front tire on my car blew out as I was uh, driving from the Brainerd Airport to our home. And my car went into some aerobatic maneuvers that I hadn't learned in flight school. And uh, after three months in hospitals and rehabilitation facilities, uh, uh, a less capable me returned to uh, duty. Anyway, I, I want to spend a, just a few minutes talking about the mobilization of the 34th Division, and I'm not going to talk about it from the division point of view. I'm going to talk about it from my point of view. At that time, uh, an 18-year-old uh, corporal in uh, Headquarters Battery 59th Field Artillery Brigade. But before I do that, I want to, to uh, point out to Dr. Doubler that uh, there is a pretty good book on uh, the, at least part of the American contribution to the battle in the Philippines and Bataan. And that's the book written by the, uh, the fellow who was the commander of the 194th Tank Battalion, Colonel Miller. Uh, and I would just point out that that tank battalion fired the first uh, tank rounds against the enemy in World War II at Lingayen when the Japanese landed and fired the last rounds uh, in the last counterattack from Corregidor uh, with the two tanks they had remaining. So it's, it's a story well told and an important story of a Minnesota Guard unit, I might point out. The, the mobilization uh, of the Guard in World War II from the, the point of view of those who were involved in it, I would tell you was sort of a frantic effort. And if you just look at the timetable, the 34th was mobilized on the 10th of February, 1941. A year later, it had already, the 1st Regiment had already been in North Ireland for a month. Uh, and in the meantime, it took part in the Texas maneuvers, the Louisiana maneuvers, and the Carolina maneuvers. Uh, so when we mobilized, we were basically at half the authorized strength of the division. And I just look, I want to tell you a little bit about how it went with the, at the company battery and troop level where the action really is. Uh, our, our commander at the time we were mobilized was a World War I guy and did not go to the mobilization camp with us. Uh, he was replaced by uh, uh, Captain Bill Martin, who was a Minneapolis cop. We had an executive officer, uh, Fritz Fredin, who was uh, a highway patrolman. Uh, Fritz, I believe, had been to one course at Fort Sill. I don't think that, uh, that Captain Martin had been to any of the regular Army uh, schools. But they understood the urgency of this operation. 
So the first part of the mobilization, after putting the tents on the tent frames and figuring out where the mess hall was and the supply room and the, and the, uh, and the battery, the orderly room, was immediately training. So every day was intense training. And I can see now, looking back at it with uh, 40 years of follow-on service, that they were sorting out the leadership. And we were, uh, you know, there were no national promotion boards or anything. All was in the hands of the local commander. And, uh, you know, just I told uh, General Nash about my own experience. I was, a, uh, by that time, I was a corporal in the survey section because I had the benefit of, uh, of uh, high school uh, trigonometry and pre-calculus and uh, other higher levels of mathematics. So I was pretty good at that. But uh, on a Saturday morning training inspection, our wire sergeant uh, screwed up. We had two types of telephones in those days. One had a, a, a C battery, two C battery uh, flashlight batteries to power it, and the other one had a flat battery. And the, the flat battery was one that you tested it by putting your tongue on the two terminals to see whether it was, <laughs> was any good. And the training inspector asked our wire sergeant to, to test the battery of this particular phone, which he insisted could be tested by tasting it. Well, it was the phone that had the C batteries in it. And of course, wrapping your tongue around both ends of a flashlight battery is pretty difficult. <laughs> so <laughs> before the Saturday morning was over, he was relieved of his duties. <laughs> and, they, uh, and Bill Martin called me in and said, what do you know about wire communication? And I said, well, I don't really know a lot. I said, I know how to hook up the telephone. So he gave me Field Manual 24-5, and he said, by Monday morning, he said, I'm going to give you an exam. And he said, uh, I want you to demonstrate the wire ties, demonstrate the ability to make a, a wire splice, uh, demonstrate the ability to install phantom circuits and ground return circuits, set up the switchboard. And then he said, uh, get yourself a pair of climbers and climb this. 80 foot pole out here. Well, I had never done any of that. And fortunately, a friend uh, who had, who knew how to do that, who had been the wire sergeant earlier, gave me a little instruction over the weekend and I passed. Uh, and what Martin had said is, if you pass, you'll be a sergeant. If you don't, you'll be a private. Uh, so, and I tell that story only to indicate the urgency that these people were under in, uh, in building an organization. Because within two months of that time, we got our first shipment of draftees. And mind you, there were no training centers. These people had no training at all. They had, they had been issued their uniforms, and they arrived uh, there to be trained. So by this time, Captain Martin had, uh, he had received something from higher headquarters that uh, outlined the training that these replacements were to get. And he called me and one other sergeant, Bob Kelsey, in, and he said, you guys are the basic trainers. You are going to implement this basic training. So and, and inside that were, was the, the the foundation that basic artillerymen got for training during, during World War II. And much of it was stuff that we didn't know. So we were one jump ahead of the trainees we were training. So in the morning, the draftees got basic training from Kelsey and me. And in the afternoon, they went to the sergeants in charge of their particular sections, and they got their advanced individual training. Uh, and by May, we were, that outfit was in the, the first of the Texas maneuvers. So it gives you some idea of, the, of the, the pressure that those junior commanders were under 
in order to get their outfits, and, and this was certainly true of the infantry companies, uh, the supply and maintenance outfits, the engineers and so forth, as well as in the artillery. Uh, and it, it worked, but you know, when you look at, when I look at the National Guard today and I look at, at uh, the 34th Division and its several mobilizations and uh, going to Iraq uh, and, the, and the wonderful preparations that were made and the, and the readiness that they had and the skilled non-commissioned officers and officers who had been trained in the, in the Army schools and compare that with the, the rudimentary sort of uh, training exercise that we went through in early 1941, uh, you can see that it's, we're light years ahead today of what we were at that particular time. The second thing that I want to just spend a few minutes on is, is something that, that you talked about, and that's the integration of the, the guard with the regular army. And blessedly, I served on the Army staff right after uh, the war in Southeast Asia when General Abrams was the chief of staff and at a time when he recognized that this was absolutely essential for the defense of the United States for the future. President Johnson had had his uh, guns and butter policy for the Vietnam War and as a result, very few guardsmen were mobilized uh, during the Vietnam War, and generally uh, the citizens of the United States were split on whether or not we should be there and even on support of the, of the operations in Vietnam and, and on their treatment of the veterans when they came back from the war in Vietnam. General Abrams, uh, although he certainly recognized that the president was commander-in-chief and could do anything he wanted to do, as long as it was supported by the Congress, and as you rightfully point out, uh, the president can't spend a dime that's not authorized and appropriated by the Congress. Uh, but he also recognized that if we had to fight in the future, that it was important that the United States have better support from the American public for the military operation than we had during the war in Vietnam. So, and he recognized, uh, Abrams recognized that the basis for that support had to be the citizen soldiers of the country, the National Guard. So we, it, Abrams got an agreement from then Secretary Schlesinger that we could keep a 15 division regular army with the end strength, the total strength of the army that ordinarily would have supported only a 10 division army. And that we would do that by pushing much of the support structure into the National Guard and reserves, but more importantly, the key part of it was integrating a National Guard brigade into the uh, regular army divisions that were stationed in the United States, that we'd have two, two brigades of regulars and one brigade of guardsmen in each of those divisions. Uh, it was a concept that when first uh, briefed to uh, uh, both to the regular army and to the, uh, and to the Army Reserve Forces Policy Board, uh, was not, didn't get wide acceptability. And I think in, in the foreword to that book of yours, I mentioned that uh, I was the guy who was to brief this to the Army Reserve Forces Policy Board, which was primarily made up of senior National Guard officers and reserve officers. And the guardsmen were primarily uh, adjutants uh, general from various states. I was a brigadier at the time and I gave the, the briefing wearing one of those uh, short sleeve green shirts. We had just, uh, that uniform had just been introduced. It was sort of a, 
neat uniform. I thought you didn't have to wear a necktie and, and uh, sleeveless shirts. You could show off your biceps. And, uh, <laughs> anyway, I stood up there and gave the briefing, and, and the senior officer on the uh, Army Reserve Forces Policy Board was uh, General John Baker, who was a longtime adjutant general uh, for New York and had later left that post and became military advisor to, to then Governor Rockefeller and later to Vice President uh, Rockefeller. And I finished my briefing and John Baker was the first one to speak and he said, General, I don't know who you are or where you came from or what your background is, but you don't know a damn thing about the National Guard. <laughs> And uh, I thought for a few minutes, of, you know, I got sort of red around the back of the neck and almost responded irresponsibly, but I didn't, and I kept my mouth shut. And we broke for lunch after answering a few questions, and then I went out and uh, put on my green blouse with my 34th Division patch on the right shoulder and came back for the afternoon. and. Someone had, in the meantime, uh, clued Baker in that I had spent five years as an enlisted man in a, in a battlefield commission in a, the longest fighting division, National Guard division, in World War II. And so Baker eventually apologized, and, <laughs> and, and the round-out concept was implemented, and I would say very successfully, uh, and we have some people, I know we have uh, General Shelito here who commanded a roundout brigade who understands that probably better than I do. I commanded a division that had a roundout brigade and so I have a little bit of an understanding about how it worked. But the one thing it did is brought the National Guard and the regular army closer together and that was the important part of it. I think we have a lot of room for bringing them even closer together uh, than we did at that time. But that's something the leadership of today uh, has to worry about. As we know, it always changes. And um, this is the man that just brought the troops back from the Middle East and commanded them for almost three years while they were there. So uh, talk about what, what these guys did. and. Uh, we got one of them right here that uh, came back with you, so critiquing you. Thank you, sir. Oh, uh, it's, it's a, is this on? Everybody can hear me just fine? I, I'm heartened to hear uh, General Vesey's stories uh, about the mobilization and some of the training that went on because it makes me feel so much better about what I did have when I went, sir. Um, you don't know what you have until you find out what you don't have, and I, I think that brings it into perspective for me. Um, I'd like to compare just a few things about the recent uh, National Guard deployments uh, along the same lines that I've been hearing tonight. And I recall at the time that I uh, was about to mobilize, my division commander came to me, uh, then Major General Erlinson, and said, what you ought to really do is read a book. I got a great book for you to read, uh, Rick Atkinson's An Army at Dawn. He says, you will not believe how fouled up your army can be. And you ought to read this book to understand what you're about to do so that you have a historical perspective of what's been done before you. And as I heard some of those same things uh, brought up again this evening, uh, and I will frame my thoughts around three different areas. One of them is the administrative, one of them is training, and one is act the actual mission that we performed uh, recently in Iraq. Administratively, changing SecDef guidance. I think I heard that this evening uh, about American policy and guidance within the, the Pentagon. Well, I guess the Pentagon wasn't even there when we, we started World War II. Uh, Army headquarters. Duration. How long are you going to mobilize? Uh, this was a question that was often asked when we were there. Uh, how long would the, the Army allow you to be mobilized? Uh, at, at the time that you went, it, it was uh, 12 months with a six months extension. When I went, it was 18 months with a six-month extension. Uh, so we were there for almost 22 months. Uh, 
as we were there, the policy changed with the new SECDEF. Uh, now the Guard can only be mobilized for a year at a time. So on my second deployment to Iraq, I was almost guaranteed a two-month train-up and a ten-month deployment. Uh, dwell time became an issue for us. Dwell time is that time that when you mobilize, you come home and dwell at home and then mobilize again. The Army continues to fight with dwell time policies. We're finding out that the Army that we have, the duration that we, ex we deploy, uh, will only allow certain amounts of dwell time at home. Uh, currently, we're trying to do uh, two to one uh, for the active. So if you're deployed for a year, you'll spend two at home. In the Guard, we're trying to do deploy for a year, stay four at home. There are certain units that are not uh, meeting that dwell time. Uh, of course, those are those high demand, low density uh, things that you need in war. Uh, engineers, uh, psyops, civil affairs, aviation. And the th last thing that we, f we fought uh, was a volunteer statement. We were involuntarily mobilized, but required to sign a volunteer statement. And if you, the, the consternation that solved a uh, problem is for a young soldier that doesn't want to let his wife know that he has volunteered to serve. And he certainly doesn't want his employer to know that he has volunteered. So we had to be very careful with that uh, policy. We had to be very careful with that uh, piece of paper uh, that we all signed that said, yes, I'm, I'm volunteering for, for this mission. So we had to be very careful with that. So uh, SECDEF guidance uh, definitely affected you then. It definitely affected us now. Uh, changing administrative instructions. And then the last one that I, I see under here is the administrative. As we hear about the guard uh, from the good doctor at the beginning of the program, uh, transforming from the square divisions to the triangular divisions. Uh, I remember going to the National Guard Bureau on one of our uh, visits just before deployment, and they said, Dave, we are going to prove to the Army with your brigade in a grand experiment that you can transform your unit at the same time that you mobilize. Uh, because at that time, we were the Army was... Uh, changing from the, uh, the triangular brigades and regiments into the brigade combat team that it now has, the modular army. And the army, the big A active army, was transforming as a unit came out of combat. So you would go do your year in combat, come home, transfer, transform into the brigade combat team, and then train up for that. Instead, they wanted to prove that the guard could do it as we mobilize, which causes uh, all sorts of problems because you don't have a task organization now when you show up. You're, you're moving into a new organization as you mobilize. You don't have the equipment that you should have for this new brigade combat team as you mobilize. So you have to pick up all this extra equipment at your mobilization station, read that Camp Claiborne back then, and find out what you've got, how to use it, and then hope you can train yourself on it well enough to go to war with. Uh, so there are some corollaries there, sir, that uh, I don't know that the Army has learned everything it should have learned, uh, but we're certainly getting a little bit better at it. Training-wise, uh, you know, we, the, the thought process when I mobilized the first time was that a brigade combat team needed six months at a mob station to become proficient at the job they were going to do. And they called that uh, full spectrum operations. And so if you were going to go to Iraq, you had to train up to first army guidance on full spectrum operations. And there was a great general officer down there um, that you may have seen on the TV at one time uh, when he gained fame in Louisiana with Hurricane uh, Katrina. Uh, Russell Honore, uh, Lieutenant General Russell Honore, uh, was my trainer when I went to Moab Station. Now, First Army had the guidance on how to train me, but as soon as you arrived in theater, you had to meet Third Army policy. And as soon as you crossed the line into Iraq, you then had to meet multinational forces Iraq's policy on training. And the three of them could never seem to be in the same room at the same time 
to decide exactly what it was they wanted you trained on. So as you crossed gates and sometimes physical boundaries, you found that the training policies, priorities, and requirements constantly changed. For instance, I remember going to uh, a pre-deployment site survey in Iraq uh, where I was told that if I didn't show up with tanks and Bradleys, I'd better not show up at all. Uh, because that was the Third Army's policy, show up with your organic quick equipment. Well, the unit I was replacing was driving Humvees. So I'm not sure what I was going to do with tanks and Bradleys. I didn't bring them to the mob station with me, and I certainly wasn't going to get them out of the state of Minnesota. So I'm not sure where the Army really expected me to get tanks and Bradleys from, and I showed up without them. The other thing that I... I I believe is a legacy of some things that occurred over the years was a mistrust in the self-assessment of the National Guard. The active army did not believe, uh, and I think it was because of some examples set earlier in the war by other units, that the National Guard was not ready, was not prepared, and wouldn't tell you the truth about their readiness. And so much of my six months at the mobilization station was actually to prove that what I said when we showed up was true. And I think uh, we could have saved the Army a lot of money, uh, the Minnesota Guard a lot of time, if we could have had a little bit more trust in me believing and saying uh, where my unit was in training and the active Army actually believing it. So we've got some work to do there. The uh, third thing that I talk about is the mission. I mentioned the armor versus no armor. I will also talk that we spent six months preparing for full spectrum operations and never used it. Instead, when we got to country, we did a job that they had labeled theater security. Theater security was probably not envisioned in many other operations. It could have been probably used in Vietnam. Uh, that was where you had uh, exterior lines of communication, so you had an outpost here and an outpost there, and to supply them you had to go out into Indian country. Our job was to actually protect the convoys that moved from outpost to outpost with those supplies. Nothing we trained at uh, at uh, our MOB station, certainly not equipped to do it with tanks and Bradleys, uh, so when we arrived and picked up the Humvees, uh, we had to redesign uh, much of our thought process around actual theater security. I want to blame the Army for that, but I also have to understand, uh, having been in Iraq, uh, I guess by the time I was done with it for about uh, 26 months, that the mission and the circumstances in Iraq changed so fast that the Army was having a tough time uh, keeping up with itself and understanding what they wanted to do tomorrow and then ask for those forces trained a specific way to show up in time to do that mission. Uh, so that that part of it, uh, I, I think in the four years uh, that you might have spent in World War II, sir, with that mobilization, uh, the mission was pretty pretty much the same. Attack, attack, attack. Uh, whereas in Iraq it changed from attack to coin to several other things before we finally got out of there. Uh, so the, the, the difference in the theater makes a hell of a good big difference uh, as how you're trained and mobilized. The last thing I'll talk about on the mission side of the, the, uh, the equation is uh, you can only imagine that a uh, brigade combat team, and as what I had, an armored brigade combat team is a pretty powerful thing. Uh, you can raise a little bit of hell with 4,000 guys in tanks and Bradleys. And they sent us to Iraq and put us in Humvees, and then they had us assigned to the Corps Support Command and told that you're not going to go out and do combat operations. It's a difficult thing to understand. We had some, El Asurio, had a few problems adjusting that. I don't think my soldiers did. So that was probably my own uh, issue to deal with, uh, that we were not doing grand maneuver in Iraq. 
I will tell you that many of those uh, problems were solved by the time we mobilized for the second time with the division. Uh, training was becoming better. Uh, they were more willing to understand that there was experience in the Guard. And I do believe that they, uh, with the programs that were put in place uh, through the uh, various adjutant generals, who could then verify that their units were trained to a s certain standard um, and sign off to the first army commander that my soldiers don't need the following three months of training because they've already done it at home station. So the trust had started to come back, uh, the training standards had come back, and uh, missions were better understood because the war pace had slowed down. So by the sec second time we um, mobilized, uh, we found things much better, I think, uh, more organized. If you can believe that what you saw there the second time, sir, was organized. Those are the conclusions that I draw from uh, Rick Atkinson's book and listening to General Vesey as well as uh, the good doctor this evening when we talked. Uh, Don Patton also wanted me to just quick mention where the 34th Division is headed now. Uh, the the relevancy of a division is commanding and controlling brigades. That's what we do at a division level. If we don't have brigades to command and control, we're really not very relevant. Um, and so what we tried, uh, we put together a training philosophy about three years ago that I'm still trying to execute today. We said what we have to do after we return from our RAC campaign is maintain the relevancy of the division headquarters by involving ourselves in as many uh, combatant commanders training exercises as, as possible. So if you can think of CENTCOMs, uh, European commands, Pacific command, Central command, Southern command, NORTHCOM, uh, and uh, AFRICOM now, yeah. And so we went out and tried to grab as many of those training exercises to take the division headquarters to and prove relevancy by participating in those exercises. In the last several years, in 2011, we went to austere challenge in Europe and participated with the Third Air Force uh, in their exercises in Europe. In 2012, we went to Yamasakura in Japan, where we participated in an exercise with the Pacific Command. This year, in 2013, we will attend Talisman Sabre, again a Pacific Command exercise where we'll take 150 soldiers uh, to Australia until a month ago when they told me that sequestration now will allow you to get as far as the west coast of the U.S. <laughs> and so you will go to uh, Fort Lewis, Washington and conduct it there uh, via the internet. <laughs> Next year in 2014 we will attend uh, a warfighter exercise a warfighter is the culminating exercise in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas's uh, BCTP, uh, Brigade Command Training Program. They also uh, stretch it up to the division level uh, where we actually fight the computer war, uh, which has in the past been the graduation event almost for a division commander uh, as he completed his command tour. And finally, in 2015, uh, the state of Minnesota will host Vigilant Guard, this is a once every four year exercise that the state is funded uh, through the National Guard Bureau uh, to work a state emergency management program with the partners within the state of Minnesota. So fire departments, police departments, homeland security, emergency management out of the state, uh, civil defense, and all the other Red Cross agencies that you can think of. Uh, we will test those exercises once in the state of Minnesota. At that time, we hope that the budget battles in Washington have been completed, that we understand and have a prioritized budget, uh, and we can further plan then uh, to get back into the COCOM exercises or at least some division-level participation to keep the Red Bulls uh, relevant as we move forward. Because it would be a waste right now uh, to uh, let that fine edge that we've built through the deployments to Iraq and Afghanistan uh, dwindle. I will tell you that the, uh, the Red Bulls continue to mobilize. Uh, we continue to send soldiers to Afghanistan and other parts of the world where we're needed. Uh, that will end as soon as the nation quits calling. Uh, so know that the Red Bulls are still engaged uh, in Afghanistan 
and elsewhere across the world. Cool. Thanks, Don. Thank you, sir. World War II took about five years. Vietnamese War took a little bit longer. We have now been in, <coughs> in Iraq, Afghanistan, and those places going on to 12 and 13 years and they never got out of there. Can you explain why this is taking so long or what we're trying to do? I think there's a, a significant difference uh, when we look at what is being asked, uh, what the end state is. Um, I think in, uh, if you were to count the post-war nation building that we did in World War II, uh, both in Japan and in the European theater, and added that to the duration of the actual war, and then compared that to what we've done in Iraq, where we've tried to conduct nation building, I think you'd find those durations are about similar. So it's really what are you trying to define, the actual combat period versus the involvement and the end states that have come out of either one. So I think there's been a little bit, maybe a little mission creep when we went into Iraq uh, for a stated purpose and then started to do nation building. Uh, that's maybe not the soldier's fault. Um, but if, I think if you compare those time frames, you'll find them almost similar. I think also you need to look at where we are in Iraq and Afghanistan, just geographically, but also culturally and, and socially. Uh, if you haven't read them, I would suggest that you read two books. They're o both old books, but they describe what happened, how the Middle East was constructed after the, the Ottoman Empire collapsed. And that, the name of that book is A Peace to End All Peace. And it's uh, written by a British historian. I think his name is Frumpkin, F-R-O-M-K-I-N. Uh, and you'll get a little better, bit better understanding of why that part of the world is structured the way it is. And then the other book is an even older book, and it's uh, called The Great Game. And it's also written by another British historian whose name escapes me at the moment. Uh, but it is the story of the earlier uh, incursions of the Western world, and principally the British and the Russians, into Central Asia and what happened as a result of those incursions. And you'll see a lot of parallels between those incursions and our own. So I would suggest that uh, to you that uh, we're operating in a place that we knew less about than we thought we knew, and, uh, and we didn't know enough about it in the first place. Uh, when the Russians got out of Afghanistan, and we've announced that we are going to get out of Af Afghanistan, is our mission just to stabilize the government there, or do we have a further or lesser mission? Wow. <laughs> I, I, I would say you ought to uh, ask uh, your, your senators and your representatives uh, who help establish those missions, because uh, I have the same question. <laughs> the stated, stated mission uh, for going to Iraq was something about WMDs. Uh, what happened? Didn't, didn't understand the question. Yeah, the, well, I think the question was uh, we went into Af Iraq uh, looking for weapons of mass destruction. Why didn't we find them? Is that about right? Yep. I've got no idea. Uh, I was told they were there also. <laughs> you said that uh, uh, once we accomplished our stated mission, we got out. Uh, it took a little longer than that. <laughs> Most of us were satisfied that the MDs over there after a few months after it started. And uh, here we are years later, uh, 
not totally disengaged yet. If I can answer that question, <clears throat> I don't think the gentleman here made those decisions to start any of that. So I couldn't hear the question. What was the question? Why didn't we get out uh, after we found out there weren't any WMDs? I, I, th I would, uh, I don't want to speak for the rest of this panel here, but uh, I would say I don't have any basis for answering that question, and, and I would suggest that the other members of the panel don't either, that that uh, uh, was a political decision made by the, the President of the United States and supported by the Congress of the United States. I, I can say one thing, though. Uh, not directly related to that, but about the character of, of the war over there. And, and I've done this, and I base this on research I've already done on this. Uh, if I had to pick one word that characterized the, especially the first year or two of the war in Iraq, it was confusion. There was confusion among the forces on the ground, we accomplished, and I have this on very good word, as our troops approached Baghdad, the question was coming, what's next? Nobody really knew. And I'm not talking about the troop level, I'm talking about the command level. And one of the things that happened was, now that the objective had been taken, the, the, and this I believe is somewhat like Vietnam, in that not, not in that the character of the conflict was changing on, the, on what we would call the enemy side. And we, we had to adapt to that and also change our force structure. One of, the, one of the differences about the war in Iraq is with the central command did not want to stay there and take over command of the country. General Franks did not want to put the, the CENTCOM flag down in Baghdad, and he did not. So they had to come up with an alternate command structure to handle the troops that were there. And, but the, the key thing I want to leave with you is that the, we, were, we did a poor job, in my opinion, as an historian, of the intelligence prep of the battlefield. Who was there? What were their interests? What were their enduring interests? And I think that that problem plagued the Army for several years. And this then, as, our, as the general said, resulted in these changing missions. Because uh, you talk about adaptation in battle that my World War II book was based on. You go, uh, one day, uh, I don't know if I'm going to do it or not, a, a classic military study can be done of adaptation in the war in Iraq, the IED war. Both sides were jockeying for an advantage. And so I'm just, I, that's the point I want to leave with you. There was a lot of confusion about the command structure, who the enemy was, what, was the, what were they doing? Were they acting rationally? It turned out they weren't. The influence of Iran and so on. So it, it was a confusing time. Just like the war in Vietnam, some say there were more, you know, there's more than one war going on at a time. That, I think, is about the way it was uh, in, in Iraq for us, especially those first years. If you didn't read it, uh, it's worth looking at, I think it was yesterday's Wall Street Journal that had a, a pretty good article uh, written by a fellow asking the Iraqi people of today about whether or not they supported the American incursion into Iraq and pointing out that, that uh, what Iraq was still not a unified country, and if you read that, A Peace to End All Peace, you'll understand why. But, uh, but it also points out that Iraq is a lot better off today than it was uh, under Saddam Hussein. So we sh uh, it's not time to belittle our effort in Iraq. Uh, yes, there was plenty of confusion about what the mission was and uh, why we were there in the first place. But, uh, but I suspect uh, 10 years from now we'll find out that uh, it was a lot more successful than it appears to be today.
Uh, going back to World War II and the Minnesota National Guard, has there been any extensive writing as far as uh, the Guard's participation in the Philippine and the Alaska campaign? When are the units got sent to those two places? Well, uh, what happened to the the various uh, units and? I don't know spe specifically. Uh, uh, General Vesey's right. E.B. Miller's book on the 194th uh, Tank Battalion is is a classic work. Uh, but in terms of a broader study, I'm not aware of one. Uh, if anybody is, they can share that with us. But that's why I say I think we need a we need some more work in that area, in terms of research and writing it because the it it was such a bitter experience. I mean, it's like Pearl Harbor number two except it's in slow motion. And uh, we've, we've honored the veterans, the Bataan March survivors, and rightly so. But kind of telling a whole narrative uh, from beginning to end, I, there's, there's room for a, for a book to do that, I believe. Yeah, the, the U.S. Uh, the official military histories, uh, the official army history of the war in the Pacific is, uh, is accurate but it is, in fact, tedious reading. Right. Uh, but, but the information is there. Right. Uh, actually, Mike, I would suggest, do you know the name Bill Barch? Lives in Dulles, Virginia. Bill Barch has written a series of books. One is called December 8th, The Pearl Harbor, or The Second Pearl Harbor, I think it is. The other is, uh, that, that's more about the attacks. He did one on Doomed at the Start that's about the air battles. These are all about the Philippines. And then uh, he did uh, another one that gets further down in the, uh, uh, the um, uh, southern Philippines and into Australia. And we did a program last year, if any of you attended, remember Operation Plum? And Operation Plum deals with that. And, and uh, uh, that was by... Uh, some local folks up here, Adrian Martin, if you recall, they spoke. But there has been some work done on that. Why do you think it's been so difficult to mobilize an effective Iraqi and Afghani force, military force? <laughs> I, I think that it's a, it's a multifaceted question because I think they do have a good, uh, in, a, in Iraq, I can only speak, I've not been to Afghanistan. Uh, I work closely with the uh, Iraqi army. I think they've got a pretty good military. Uh, it is good enough to beat down any internal security threat that country has. It is not like the U.S. Army. It cannot leave the borders of Iraq and conduct a campaign in a foreign country. It cannot do that. Uh, but as far as beating down any internal security threat to Iraq, I don't think there's one that's there today that can compare to the Iraqi army. I mean, you, you hear about the spectacular bomb uh, attacks that occur, uh, one off, so there'll be one in one town one day and one in another town, but you don't see anybody overthrowing the government. You don't see anybody else uh, taking control of the cities. So I, I think the Iraqi army is pretty effective today. Uh, I think, you know, there's some interesting comparisons that you can do with the Iraqi army to the U.S. army. At the time that we invaded the country, both armies were about the same. The U.S. Army had about 500,000 soldiers in it, and so did the Iraqi Army. Uh, the difference was the Iraqi Army had uh, 17,000 generals, and the U.S. Army had 250. <laughs> so what was important in the Iraq Army? You know, uh, The Iraq Army, when you get to it and, and look at it, it's a very regional army. All right, so if you're joining the Iraqi army in Basra, you would never expect to move from the city of Basra and defend another part of the country. Why would I do that? I'm from Basra. I joined the Basra army, not the Iraq army. So you've got to understand the differences between the two. But I, I, I think for internal security, they've got a very good, very good army in Iraq. OK, uh, let's uh, end it up. I want to thank you, gentlemen for being part of this this evening. Uh, General Shelto, General Nash, for supporting this. Underwriting for this program provided by
Additional support provided through the Catherine B. Anderson Fund of the St. Paul Foundation. Upcoming roundtable topics can be found at www.mn-ww2roundtable.org. Production services provided by Barrows Productions. <laughs>